Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Gina Ville, the Chief Communications Officer for Harvard Medical School. And for all of you watching at our Longwood campus and those of you watching from around the world on live streaming, I welcome you today. I'd like to begin with something that will illustrate exactly how bacteria is becoming impervious to drugs. So what we ended up building was basically a petri dish, except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands, and at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much. 100 times, and then finally the middle band has a 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, pour some thin agar that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic, up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right, it's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. And then you see the different mutants <laughs> repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. This represents the work of one of our speakers today, Michael Bam, and his colleagues at Harvard Medical School. The video has been viewed by more than 25 million people. It's gone viral and has become an educational tool that is helping the public understand, the, <clears throat> understand how antibiotic resistance works. Today's topic is increasingly relevant. And for many of us, as you can see from the video, it's terrifying. <coughs> Excuse me. Antibiotic resistance, the ability of bacteria to evade the very drugs designed to eradicate them, threatens to return us to a time when sim simple infections are fatal. Each year in the U.S. alone, about 2 million people become infected with bacteria resistant to antibiotics, and nearly 23,000 of them die. Irresponsible use of antibiotics is one of the major factors fueling antibiotic resistance worldwide. But there are other reasons that are seen. How did this happen? What's in store? And what can we do about it? These are some of the questions that today's speaker will help us unravel. And we have a very unusual, excellent pairing of speakers for this program. Michael Bam is a research fellow in systems biology in the Kashani lab at Harvard Medical School. He says antibiotic resistance, in addition to being one of the top public health threats of our time, also provides an excellent system for studying evolution, and we're going to hear more about that. Scott Podolsky is professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. He specializes in the history of 19th and 20th century therapies in medical education, um, with a focus on the history of antibiotics. His latest book, The Antibiotic Error, Reform Resistance and the Pursuit of Rational Therapeutics, was published in 2015. Please join me in welcoming our two special guests, Michael. All right, so thank you. Um, and welcome everyone on the live stream. So I want to start in the sort of spirit of talking a bit about the history of this with some of the history of antibiotics. So as many of you probably know, through most of human history, infections and infectious disease accounted for almost 40% of all mortality. 
These days, it's about 7%. And that's really due to a combination of vaccines and antibiotics. Um, before antibiotics, of course, you could fall down, skin your knee, get an infection, lose your leg. This sort of things happened all the time. Um, this got a lot better in 1928 and subsequent decades of the discovery of penicillin. People were very happy about that. Um, but not long after it was introduced, resistance showed up. But that was OK, because in 32, sulfonamides were discovered. But there was resistance to those actually already in 42. But you know, that was still OK, because by 1944, there was tetracyclines. There's resistance in 1950, and you get the idea. It's sort of impossible to talk about antibiotics or antibiotic without talking about resistance, without talking about this fact that no matter what antibiotic we come up with, resistance seems to inevitably show up not that long later. And the way that it spreads is almost very basic. It's like the classic example of evolution, right? There's some population with a bit of resistance. With the antibiotic, you wipe out everything that isn't resistant, and then it can spread totally happily. And unfortunately for us, evolution works really, really well. Um, as Gina said, right now, it's over 23,000 lives per year in the US. It's about 25,000 in Europe and about 300,000 globally. And that number is increasing with sort of more and more apocalyptic predictions, like 10 million lives. and enormous amount of money. Um, and I think regardless of, of these numbers, one of the key points is that modern medicine really relies on antibiotics. And not just to treat infections, but also to keep people safe in surgery and any sort of immunosuppressive therapy. You know, the whole, so much of modern medicine relies on having these tools and having them work in hospitals. So we're in a lot of trouble. if if they stop working, even in that limited sense. Um, and because of this, you see sort of increasingly, increasingly urgent headlines, like, um, there we go, you know, talking about combating antibiotic resistance, or it's humanity's greatest threat, or we're losing the war against antibiotic resistance superbugs. Um, but if you think about it, right, it's kind of a one-sided war. Like, we're trying to fight them. They have no idea who or what we are. They're just sort of growing and responding to whatever pressures we put on them. And, and that's really the point, that resistance isn't evolving adversarially. It's really evolving in response to these specific evolutionary pressures that we're putting on bacteria. And the point really is that this is not, this isn't a magic process. This isn't the black box. There are very specific ways that it happens and they seem to be repeatable. They bring along with them other consequences. And the idea is that to the extent we can use this, to the extent we can predict it, we can maybe use this dynamic to our advantage. So I want to tell you a little bit about today understanding it, understanding how resistance evolves, and some ways we might try to use that to come up with therapies. Um, but first, a little bit of background. But you know, maybe we should talk about actually what antibiotic resistance is. Um, and then I'll tell you a bit more about how it happens and eventually a little bit about how we can fight it. So antibiotics, you know, just so we're on the same page, these are, these are chemicals typically given therapeutically that kill or inhibit bacteria. And the key point is those last two words, not us. Um, you know, bleach is a really, really good <laughs> antimicrobial, but it's just as good at killing you. So you don't want to take that. Um, and a neat fact, they're actually often produced by other microbes, as discovered by this, this guy, the poster child for 100 years of not cleaning up after yourself, right? Because Fleming went away on vacation and came back and found a plate, this plate, of, of Staph aureus with a mold growing in them and very critically noticed that near the mold, the bacteria weren't doing as well. And of course, this is the famous story of how penicillin was discovered. Now, another good point is what antibiotic resistance isn't. Um, a surprisingly common misconception is that it's humans becoming resistant. It, it, that's not, not what's happening. It really is the bugs changing. You know, if you've had a resistant infection before, that means nothing about an infection you might get in the future. You don't become resistant. The bugs do. Uh, it's also not new. This isn't a new thing. I mean, this is 
a paper from 2011 that I particularly like where they dug down into Alaskan permafrost and about 25,000 year old permafrost around with you know, mammals and other things before there was any human contact, they found plenty of active resistance genes. In fact, from the genetic evidence, it's likely that resistance, both antibiotic production and resistance, was around before there was multicellular life. So this is a very, very old thing. And it's actually not even new clinically. This is, this is another one of my, my favorite results. This is the very first sample in the British Culture Collection from a soldier in 1918 who died of dysentery. Um, a few years ago, this group led by Kate Baker went back and sequenced it and tested it. And it turns out it was penicillin resistant in 1918, 10 years before the discovery of penicillin. So, you know, these things come into the clinic anyway. We're sort of not going to stop that. We need to deal with what do we do once they're there. Um, so, so what's resistance? Well, you know, this is, this is sort of another fact that we were, we were chatting about the other day, that for almost every bacterium and for almost every drug, there is some dose that will kill it or that will inhibit its growth. You know, and what we care about for treatment is that as we have more antibiotics, there's some middle concentration where we're okay and the bug isn't. And what we mean by resistance is not that the bug becomes necessarily immune, but rather the amount that kills it rises up to a level that becomes dangerous to us or even a little higher than that. And so you know, the question, the thing I want to talk to you about for the next what, 10 minutes or so is how resistance increases. Um, which you know, can happen by these two mechanisms, either spontaneous mutation or they can share very specialized resistance genes. I'm going to talk to you about the first one, about some efforts to sort of capture that process of spontaneous resistance mutations. Um, so in order to do this, we need to experimentally capture evolution. And, and this is tough because, well, this is sort of normally how we think about evolution. It's, you know, it takes millions or billions of years, or I guess if you're Rich Lensky, 20 years, but we'd rather do it faster than that. We'd like to have it sort of more, more like, a, well, more contemporary example, like, like this, um, where you press a button that says evolve and evolution happens. And the trick to this, the trick to, to making this happen so fast is exactly the same way that a video game teaches you to play it better, which is it gradually ramps up the difficulty. You know, you start with just a little bit of antibiotic and keep bumping them up a bit and a bit. But this is tough because, you know, with too little, you get no adaptation. And you can't mess up the other direction because dead things don't evolve. Um, and this has been done quite classically for a long time. Um, the simplest way to do it is just, you know, standard microbial culture on more and more antibiotics. And um, does anyone want to guess when this was first done with antibiotics? The uh, very first paper demonstrating the production of penicillin in 1941, before it was introduced, they actually were able to show this. Um, this was solved much more, much more elegantly when I was just getting to Harvard Medical by, by this guy, Erdal Toprak and Roy Kashoni, by building a device, the Morbidistat, that's every bit as complicated as it looks. Um, it's a control system that co continually ramps up and down the amount of drug to make sure that you're always in that nice spot. And the description of it that I really like is, this is probably my favorite figure that's ever been published, um, <laughs> by Friedman and Balaban. Describing this process as a game of bacterial whack-a-mole, where we're hitting them with bigger and bigger hammers, and they're evolving bigger and bigger hats. Um, but if you, know, if you look out into nature at what sort of evolution happens, really what's happening in this flask is only sort of half the story. It's, half of, it's missing the very essential dynamic, right? Because if you're growing in a flask, in order to take over, you need to be better than everything around you. However, there's another dynamic, range expansion, where basically in order, you, know, you don't need to be better than everything around you, you just need to be the first to get somewhere that no one else can grow, 
Um, and so, you know, in order to sort of demonstrate this, to play with this stuff, we, we built a toy model. And Tammy, Remy, and Roe, uh, we were all here in the Kashoni lab at the time, decided to try to build a, a device uh, inspired by, by a Hollywood billboard, actually, that Roy, Roy saw for the movie Contagion. Um, and what we ended up building after, after all of this was a Petri dish. Uh, <laughs> But it's really, really big. It's about two feet by four feet. Um, not that much smaller than it appears on the screen, in fact. And the way we set this up was, as the video before says, on the bottom, there's different amounts of antibiotic. And then up in the top, there's this thin layer of agar that let E. coli move around to wherever they're happy being. Um, so we can get some photos of that's pouring it, and then on top, that's the thin agar. And the great thing about it being so big, of course, is that we can just put a camera in the ceiling and record really what it looks like. So I'm going to show you the same video you saw before. Um, again, the E. coli start on the outside, and there's this exponential gradient of antibiotics as they go towards the center. Each second of this video is about five hours of real time. So I'm going to start it again. And you see, first they grow up, sure enough, and stop at the boundary where there's enough antibiotic. This mutation. But all these other mutations are happening at the same time. Right? It's not just one way, necessarily. You can see from the lines that they're competing with each other. You can see that mutants need to mutate again to get even more resistance. They seem to pause. And they pause because the mutations that were acquired that let them get through the first boundary don't necessarily give enough resistance to make it through the second one. They need to ramp up the amount of resistance. Um, so two, two questions that I, I often get when I show this video to people. Uh, the first one is sort of the obvious one, right? Does it, does it have to be this big? Um, and the other one's a little bit more subtle, which is, doesn't, doesn't the drug diffuse? And you know, the answer to both of these is, of course, well, the answer to the second one's, of course, yes, because there's no way you're stopping physics. Diffusion is going to happen. But it needs to be so big precisely because of the diffusion. So in fact, when it's this big, because of that, it takes 10 years to equilibrate, give or take, exactly because diffusion is quadratic, whereas the sort of chemotaxis is linear. That's why it needs to be so big so that the scale sort of sets the relative importance of diffusion and, and transport. And as we found out, when things go viral, people take fun photos of you uh, <laughs> staring at black agar. Um, but, oh, and I just killed the video. Oh, there we go. Um, well, now that we can watch it again, you know, there's there are things you can actually see. And one of the things that we really like about this is that there are all these features of evolution that are normally hard to see, that are difficult to piece out, that just pop right out. You, know, you can see mutation happening. You can see sequential mutation happening. You can see this diversification that the same mutant results in two different, uh, different downstream mutants that can basically do the same thing. You can measure how fit neighbors are by the curvature. And, and something that... You may have noticed watching it these two times is interesting. It's actually a tie. Um, and I'm not going to get into that. I'm happy to in questions. But that has to do with how, how resistance to this particular drug evolves. Um, so things we might want to ask, you know, what, what are the paths in there? How are the strategies different? And do we actually get different results? Um, and in order to get at this, one of, the, one of the great features is that when bacteria fall behind this spreading front, they don't die. They just kind of stop. Um, and so I was able to go back and sample from every single one of these points. And what you saw earlier was actually drawing the phylogenetic tree, the history, from the video. But because they're still alive, you can actually sample each one, measure how resistant it is, and then map that back on. And because it's 2016, sequence everything. Um, <laughs> And you know, we find neat things, like this particular mutation. This particular mutant has several 
mutation in the target site, but its progeny take two completely different strategies to get more resistant. And even though it looks like they're both getting the same amount of resistance, this top one is probably not going to have resistance to other drugs, whereas this bottom one is sort of a general stress response that will probably give you resistance to other drugs. Um, you know, another, another question, another thing when we're looking at these strategies is what's going on there? Right? That part looks completely different than everything else. And you can actually answer this if you just turn the contrast way up. This is literally turning the contrast up in PowerPoint. You can see that there's this faint front coming out. This is actually a mutant that has sacrificed the ability to grow to the full density for antibiotic resistance. So it's able to spread out with this cost. But then its progeny that pop up in the middle They've figured out a way around the cost, but still have resistance. And so then they grow out like these little spheres. Um, so I want to show you, I think I have two more videos. So it'll be, it'll be close. I might go over by a, a couple of minutes. Um, what happens when we do this with ciprofloxacin? This is the same setup, though by a happy accident of dilution, it's got 50 times as much drug in it. Um, and it's about twice the speed. So each second is about 10 hours of real life spreads to the boundary, and then these faint mutants will appear in the lower right and the left. And sure enough, very quickly, compensatory mutations everywhere, because many Cipro resistance mutations are costly. But then a neat thing's about to happen. So one of these compensatory mutations is about to fix at the front. There. And then it's game over from there. Um, and what's actually happening here is that with Cipro, you don't need that many mutations to get an enormous amount of resistance. And so as soon as that happens, even well behind where it needs to, you, know, you get these mutants with 100,000 times as much resistance as the wild type. Um, of course, we see compensatory mutations everywhere. One side is vastly faster. And this sort of neat phenomenon that we get very high resistance behind the front. Um, so the one last thing I want to show you is another question that I, I often get, which is, you know, do you really need to have it 1, 10, 100, 1,000? What if you just went 0 to 1,000 directly, or 1 to 1,000, or 0 to 100? Right? What, what's a poor bacterium to do uh, in, this, in this case? So we set up this experiment here, which this one takes a little bit more work to explain. On the outside and in the center, there's 1,000 times what they can survive. In these two middle bands, or I guess a third of the way through, there's no drug. And then between those and the 1,000, there's every intermediate 0, 1, 10, 100. It's at the same speed as the first video, about five seconds. So you know, luckily, it spreads from 0 to 0 quite, quite easily. That's what it should do. You get them to one time the drug quickly, 10. A little bit slower, but then it pauses from 1 to 1,000. And these two in the center are actually going to get to the center at the same time. And then over on the left, you'll see it made it from 0 to 100. And it'll eventually make it into 1,000 there. But it's actually not going to make it from 0 to 1,000. Um, and we can repeat this. And no matter how long we wait, it's never making it from 0 to 1,000 directly. That this large jump seems to be enough to stop things. Um, and in fact, this is a general phenomenon that we see for a number of drugs, where these intermediate concentrations, you know, levels of resistance that are below the clinical breakpoints, dramatically potentiate resistance to very, very high amounts of antibiotics that, are clini that is clinically relevant. Um, this is also an interesting a mechanism by which these sort of small environmental exposures from, from cosmetics, from soap, could actually potentiate future resistance evolution. So in my last minute or so that I have, I want to talk about how we can influence this evolution. Um, you know, it's sort of, sort of a difficult task, right? Because every time we treat with a drug, we're inevitably selecting for resistance against that drug. So, so how do we decouple it? Um, and the answer is, is combination therapy. If treating with one drug inevitably selects against it, then well, then we need to change the game, right? We can't treat with one drug. Um, 
Something often you hear suggested is, well, why not just stop using a class of antibiotics for a while and see if resistance comes back? Uh, this is sort of a tempting intuition, right? Bacteria were sensitive before, although we saw that's not actually completely true. Um, maybe there's some pressure pushing them back that way naturally. And the problem with this is basically that it's evil and it doesn't work, right? You're both withholding life-saving treatment, and also you know, the times that this has been done, it doesn't work all that well for bacteria. It does seem to work a little bit for malaria, but that's something else entirely. Um, and the reason for this is you know, the costs, sort of the pressures don't have to be equivalent. Bacteria were around for billions of years before we were. You know, maybe if you wait for a billion years, resistance will go away. But we need it to go away much, much faster than that. And then there are some other, other results recently <coughs> showing that actually if bacteria live with a resistance gene for long enough, they start to become addicted to it and depend on it. And so this is sort of led to this idea of, well, why don't we try to develop evolutionary therapies? Um, this is, all right, I have about two minutes left, so. The idea of this is, well, I like to, I like to talk about it as a one-two punch, but for um, more distinguished audiences, here's a chess metaphor to play a move ahead. This is the idea that if you can treat in a way that the evolution is predictable, maybe you can exploit that. So, you know, a trivial example, patient comes in with an infection, you give them some treatment and they're cured. Or there's some possibility that resistance emerges or is present. And so you've designed A in such a way that since there's sensitivity to B necessarily comes with, with it, and then you can give B and cure the patient again. Um, and two ways that I'm not going to get into that we've been trying to look at this recently are the idea of selecting against resistance. This is both the notion of cross-resistance, which is finding pairs or combinations of drugs that are both themselves antibiotics that we can cycle between um, to try to forestall resistance, or looking for compounds that aren't necessarily antibiotics at all in the classical sense, but that preferentially inhibit resistant bacteria. And we've actually managed to find a few of these in the last couple of years. Um, but the point of all of this really is that in order for this to work, for this to happen at the on any sort of deployable level, we need doctors at the point of care need to know what they're dealing with, and we need diagnostics. So I want to tell you just in the last two slides, this is sort of how diagnostics are done now. This is how it's been done since, well, how long, the 30s or 40s? Sure. Um, and there are some new technologies, but broadly what happens is a doctor takes a sample, it's cultured, it's plated to identify what it is, and finally you test what it's resistant to, and this whole process you know, takes 48 to 72 hours, and so if somebody needs to make a decision on how to treat a patient in an hour, you know, this is obviously not a very useful sort of diagnostic paradigm, and so for this reason, antibiotic use these days is actually largely ad hoc. Um, the idea, the hope, is that with these emerging sequencing and quick prep technologies, that will actually be able to very, very rapidly at the point of care get data. And then from that, not only get species and resistance profile, but all of these other things that you couldn't necessarily get just from phenotypic plating, how evolvable it is, how pathogenic it is, and even maybe what else is around it that might transfer resistance to that pathogen. Um, and the hope really is to enable antibiotics as, as precision therapies with this. But ultimately, to fight resistance, we're really going to need a portfolio. I mean, right now, there's been a bunch of drug discovery, obviously, since the 30s, um, efforts to improve infection control in hospitals, vaccines, and the areas that I'm particularly excited about in the future are these narrow-spectrum antibiotics that don't necessarily hit other things, um, combinations and sequential therapies, of course, uh, guiding this genomically, and then actually trying to manipulate the evolution directly. So I want to very briefly thank all of the people whose work appeared in this, the whole Kashoni lab, in particular, Tammy, um, Laura, and Eric, Joy, Remy, Roe, of course, and Buzz. Um, and I will hand it over to Scott. So super cool talk. And it's an honor to get to follow Michael. Uh, my book has not sold 25 million copies. <laughs> but, so 
So about 50 years ago, Selman Waxman, who had won the Nobel Prize for discovery of streptomycin, who coined the very term antibiotics, said in a private interview, what is the future of antibiotics? Antibiotics are here to stay. The antibiotic error will accomplish what nature has intended it to be, man's control over infectious diseases and epidemics that have plagued mankind since prehistoric times. Half century later, in 2013, Dame Sally Davis sounded a very different note, stating that antimicrobial resistance is a ticking time bomb, not only for the UK, but also for the world. We need to work with everyone to ensure the apocalyptic scenario of widespread antimicrobial resistance does not become a reality. This is a threat arguably as important as climate change for the world. And in this discourse, we hear tropes like apocalyptic, post-antibiotic era, and increasingly the ubiquitous superbugs. But these aren't entirely new concerns. The first instance I can find of the term superbug in any kind of literature dates almost exactly 50 years ago to 1966 in this Look Magazine article when are germs winning the war against people. And I like the cartoon so much that I used it for the cover of my book. Um, so today I'm going to look at about seven decades of antibiotic reform efforts. So this is a political history. And I'll start off with the post-World War II advent and then widespread marketing of the antibiotics. And then I'll look at two consecutive uh, reformist streams. The first one, looking at the F very narrowly at the FDA as site of market entry for new drugs. The second, starting, and that was in the 50s and 60s. A second one, really starting about that time and extending through today, looking at the larger issues of bacterial resistance overall. Then I'll look at sort of the successes and the limitations of these reform efforts, and even the way they, they've come into direct conflict, including this very last week. So Michael already drew attention to the advent of the sulfa drugs in the 1930s, penicillin in, in, during World War II, and streptomycin thereafter. I'm really going to start with what came immediately after that, the advent of what were called broad-spectrum antibiotics, which were first introduced to the market between 1948 and 1950. And here you see ads for Lederle's core tetracycline, Park Davis's chlorinfenicol, and uh, Pfizer's oxytetracycline, or teramycin. And I love this slide. All right, so this shows the literal change in scale brought about by the advent of the broad-spectrum antibiotics. So on the first slide, we see antinumococcal antiseria used in the 1930s. This is like an $800,000 a year drug. The sulfa drugs come on board. Uh, this is, this, these slides are from Leaderly. These literally transform the research base of companies like Leaderly. Merck itself is transformed during this time. Penicillin is a little bit less profitable than the sulfa drugs. A any idea why? No one patented it. This was made during, during, during World War II cooperation within the pharmaceutical industry. So that the president of Pfizer, speaking before the New York Board of Exchange in 1950, says, look, if you want to lose your shirt in a hurry, keep making penicillin. The goal was to make their own novel, broad-spectrum, and patentable, and highly marketable drugs. And you can see what happens, right? So, so court tetracycline, or mycin, is a $60 million a year drug. Acromycin, which is tetracycline, becomes an $80 million a year drug. And literally transforms the pharmaceutical industry. And of course, much of this is based on real medical need. But it's also transformed by a, by a parallel revolution in pharmaceutical marketing. Right? And much of what we think of today as high sales, um, high pressure sales of pharmaceuticals emerges in the competitive crucible of the pharmaceutical, of the sorry, the broad spectrum antibiotic wars as they were considered at the time. Right? So drug detailing, a company like Pfizer goes from two detail people in 1950 to 2000 in 1956. And these campaigns are waged like military campaigns and really described in the language of combat. And so these are from the National Archives. Uh, on the left side, this is a, a, a Pfizer document that plans are being completed for the forthcoming regional meeting. Approximately half the region will blitz Memphis. The other half will blitz Birmingham simultaneously. And the right side is a rejoinder from Leaderly saying, holding the line in the hospitals is a 24-hour ulcer. By and large, we're in good shape, but the sniping is terrific. In all these, the prey, this one's labeled, easy prey for termites and to prey were the doctors, right, who are the ones who are being convinced to, to use these drugs, whether through direct discussion or through the, uh, the use of samples. And so between 1950 and 1956, antibiotic usage increases uh, fourfold in the United States. Again, much of this, of course, is, is based on real need. But this is also the era when, when patterns of receipt and administration of antibiotics, I come in with a cold, I get my antibiotics, I recover. Therefore, the next time I expect more antibiotics, these patterns are being generated during this sort of embryonic time of the advent of antibiotics in our society. So that by 1954, Alan Hussar and Michael Holley can say that, that the patient or his family demands a shot of penicillin is not the cause, but the product of indiscriminate antibiotic administration. 
But the real source for the first wave of antibiotic reform was actually done out of Harvard. It was Max Finland, based at Boston City Hospital, and literally lives, uh, pretty much lives at Boston City Hospital, and is the leading clinical investigator of antibiotics throughout the 20th century. Oh, sure. There we go. Is that better? There we go. Can, can you all hear okay? Sorry about that. I, suffice to say that people were using a lot of antibiotics at this point. That, that, that'll, that'll summarize where, where we're at. <laughs> and and, and Max, Max Finland uh, would really, in some ways, narrow the focus of the reform effort away from being able to, to influence individual prescribers, which was tough, and really looking at the, at the FDA as site of market entry of new drugs. And to place that in context, just briefly remind us where we are with respect to the FDA in the 1950s. At that point, it's only empowered to adjudicate drug efficacy, at least, uh, sorry, drug safety, at least ex, uh, explicitly, not drug efficacy. So what he saw was the market being flooded with, with ever more antibiotics in what he conceived of as a regulatory vacuum. Okay. And while he was already concerned about the broad spectrum of antibiotics, what really got him concerned or what was this first generation of fixed dose combination antibiotics. Right, this is, these are pre precursors to what Michael was talking about. But basically, by the early 1950s, as we saw, after penicillin and resistance to penicillin, you had the advent of broad spectrum antibiotics, you had resistance to that. So, pharmaceutical industry said, well, we're going to combine our existing drugs like tetracycline with novel drugs coming through the pipeline to make these fixed dose combination antibiotics widely, with wide ranges of efficacy and perhaps synergy. In, in, in their usage against um, bugs in the clinic. But when people like Max Finland and his colleagues tested these drugs, they found that not only could they be synergistic, but they could actually be antagonistic, and hence no better than their component parts, perhaps worse than their component parts, and not amenable to fixed dose um, preparations. So they saw this as a real advent of style over substance. However, at the 1956 symposium, so the head of the FDA's division of antibiotics, his name was Henry Welch. He ran all the major symposia in the field. He ran all the major journals in the field. And he leads off the 1956 symposium with the following quote that, it's quite possible we're now in a third era of antibiotic therapy, where combinations of chemotherapeutic agents, particularly synergistic ones, will be customarily used. Max Finland was presumably sitting in the front row, and he was really aggravated. Right? This comes out, um, I meant to say that Welch's comments are then mailed to every clinician in the country by Pfizer within a month. So Finland's agitated. This is a picture of Max Finland with Henry Welch at the 1956 symposium. Everybody looks very chummy in this picture, but if you turn it over, it's Finland's a photo. It says Henry Welch and his harem. <laughs> so he's agitated. Um, he and, and Harry Dow Dowling, his first fellow, they start writing letters, and they say, a lobby needs to be formed. It needs to compete with the lobby of the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, this, this is what they're saying at the time. And their, their strategy is to flood the literature, the diatribes against these, these, these indiscriminate uses of, of fixed dose combination antibiotics of advertising. But they take a very practical tact as well. Finland basically opposes the quote unquote the testimonial, this notion of I as a researcher may get the drug, treat 100 consecutive cases of pharyngitis, everyone gets better, I therefore report it, therefore the drug gets approved and I can market on that basis. He says what we really need to compete with testimonials are rigorously controlled trials. Right? We often think of the methodological history of the controlled trial from case studies to randomized controlled trials. This is the social history of the controlled clinical trial as a way of taming the marketplace. And here the testimonial is really juxtaposed to the, to the controlled trial itself. This could have been a, a largely intra-professional debate. So in 57, he writes an article called The New Antibiotic Era, For Better or For Worse, and it's co-signed by 17 of the leading infectious disease experts of the time. But it gets taken up in, January, in um, early 1959 by John Lear, the editor of the Saturday Review, in an important article called Taking the Miracle Out of Miracle Drugs, where he echoes many of the comments made by Max Finland and his colleagues. And this is happening just as Senator Estes Kefauer is beginning his own landmark hearings into the pharmaceutical industry. So Kefauer himself is a fascinating character. He's a liberal senator from Tennessee. Um, he makes his name in the early 1950s investigating the mob. He becomes Ali Stevenson's running mate in the 1956 election. And by the late 50s, he turns his attention to the pharmaceutical industry. He's originally concerned with monopolistic pricing. But as these issues within, about advertising and the inability of the FDA to adjudicate drug efficacy come to the fore, he really shifts the hearings in that direction. And the most scandalous part of the hearings is when it's found that Henry Welch, who had made that comment about the third era, 
It turns out he made about $300,000 in 1950s money by the reprints and advertising in his journals. The very term third era of, of, of antibiotics was written by a Pfizer medical student uh, working for Pfizer at that time. So he's, uh, he's fired. Um, and then the bill uh, kind of waxes and wanes over the ensuing two years. It's about to fall off the table. And then thalidomide breaks in mid-1962. And while all the original pricing and patent concerns fall off the table, the mandate that drugs be found efficacious based on adequate and well-controlled investigations um, by experts qualified to do this gets written to the law. This is 1962 and really sets the stage for drug approval that continues to this time. But what happens after that is the FDA is faced with the dilemma of what do we do about the 4,000 products that have been approved between 1938 and 1962? So they formed what's called the Drug Efficacy Study, and they convene panels of experts to evaluate every drug on the market. There's 30 panels. Five of them are devoted to antibiotics. And by 1969, each panel says that every fixed-dose combination antibiotic at that time is no better than its component parts and should be taken off the market. Well, Upjohn at this point gets, gets very upset. Penalba uh, was a $30 million a year drug. Clinicians are very upset about this. They're saying, I, I've been using these drugs for 10 years. Trust me, they work. You're taking this away my therapeutic autonomy. So Upjohn takes this to the, to the courts. They, they sue the FDA. There are two congressional hearings on this. This wins its way through the courts throughout the year. In, in the um, context of this, the commissioner of the FDA, Herbert Lay, says, OK, here's what I mean by a good study. And he's forced to define this. If you want, uh, the, the gold standard is the double-blinded, placebo-controlled, randomized control trial. And if you don't do that, you better have a good reason for that. And when the Supreme Court finds in favor of the FDA, this gets written into law, basically. And this is a landmark era, A, for the, empower the empowerment of the FDA to be able to shape and reshape pharmaceutical markets. It's sort of the apotheosis of the controlled clinical trial to a place where it's pretty much uh, retained to this time. But it's also the end of a particular era of antibiotic reform. It's a successful era, but it's a limited era, really just focused on the FDA as site of market entry. And while they had taken these inappropriate drugs off the market, seemingly, nobody had done anything about stopping the inappropriate prescribing of existing good drugs. So by 1974, you see articles like this entitled, This is Medical Progress, where they say that against a 5% rise in population between 1967 and 71, there's a 30% increase in antibiotic prescribing. And by 1978, Calvin Coonan, who had led one of those uh, panels, says, a decade ago, some of us working in this field believed we had scored a major victory when the FDA removed fixed dose combination antibiotics from the market. This was no victory, but abject defeat. And while he was continued to be concerned about adverse effects, super infections, and costs, he increasingly became, like, like many of his ilk at this time, were concerned about antibiotic resistance. So I'm now going to look at the second stream that intersects that first stream and pretty much look at the political history of concerns about antibiotic resistance over the last 60 years. And we'll do this in like five minutes. Um, I usually do this through four hours, but I've now introduced it into five hours. The point is that, as Michael had said, antibiotic resistance was noted from the beginning. And this comment is from, the 19, it's from 1954, when staphylococcal resistance was really the most feared resistance at the time. And this is a, this is a British comment. But those deadly staff are not pirates or privateers actually encountered. They're detachments of an army. They're also portents. There are parallels in agriculture. We plow the fields and scatter insecticides and selected weed killers on the land. We find we have killed birds, bees, flowers who minister in various ways to our health and happiness and with whom we have no quarrel. We should study the balance of nature in field and hedgerow, nose and throat and gut before we seriously disturb it. Again, we may come to the end of antibiotics. We may run clean out of effective ammunition and then how the bacteria and molds will award it. So that's from 1954, so that when we think about the fact that we're now generating all this attention to antibiotic resistance, just generating attention itself is not enough. Right? So we've known about this for, for, for decades. Already at the time, we had some people calling for, quote unquote, a crusade for the rational use of antibiotics. But we've already seen in the United States, this was really focused more on the FDA as site of market entry at that time. And if anything, there was a real optimism that in this, quote unquote, arms race between bugs and drugs, that we uh, could keep up. And in fact, in the 1950s, new drugs were literally introduced as uh, solutions to antibiotic resistance. So when erythromycin gets marketed for the first time in the 1950s, this is marketed as when staff resist. Things change, however, in 1963. Michael had drawn attention to the notion of horizontal gene transfer, of bacteria sharing resistant bugs ac even across species. And this really changes the dynamics at the time. So this comes out in 1963. This was the context for the, um, that, that original depiction of the superbug in 1966. In the 1960s were the era of Rachel Carson and Silent Spring environmentalism. 
So we see articles with names like environmental pollution with resistant microbes or infectious drug resistance. The doctors were aggravated, right? They, they, they'd taken, had their fixed dose combination antibiotics taken away from them. They didn't really want to be told what to do at this point. So in 74, Medical Times interviews or sent out a survey for, to about 10,000 family practitioners asking whether they, in fact, are prescribing too much. 5,000 take the time to reply, which at half say, no, we're not. And the responses are great. This one's from, from Texas saying, I'll tell you, the only thing I think is being overprescribed, and that's a hell of a big overdose of government being rammed down the esophagus of the medical profession. Like any other OD, it's either going to injure or kill the patient, in this case, yours and my profession. And while these are great for historians you know, to see this in retrospect, they were also being heard at the time. So that same year when the um, FDA and the American College of Physicians and the AMA convened a panel and a committee on antibiotic resistance and, and, over, and, and drug overuse, premise number two was that physicians do not want the major ruling on antibiotic usage to come from Washington. But, but during the 1970s, antibiotic resistance has, continues to be recognized. People like Tom O'Brien are instrumental in drawing attention to this. We see ever more plasma-mediated um, antibiotic resistance. And it's really a pivotal moment in 1981 when Stuart Levy convenes a symposium on the molecular biology, pathogenicity, and ecology of bacterial plasmids in Santo Domingo. And there, he and 142 clinicians and scientists signed a statement regarding worldwide antibiotic misuse. And many of their concerns at that time, the usage of antibiotics in agriculture, usage without prescription, uh, overmarketing of drugs, are already um, noted during this time. He, comes back, he uses this for, for, as a launching pad for the Alliance for Prudent Usage of Antibiotics, and Dr. O'Brien becomes the vice president of the organization. And this really is the birth of sort of a political, global movement regarding antibiotic resistance. But their hopes during the 1980s to really convene large uh, commitments and political commitments to this are really thwarted during the Reagan era of public health retrenchment. But by 1988, they obtained an important ally, Joshua Lederberg. Right? So Lederberg had won the Nobel Prize in 1958 at the age of 33 for the discovery of bacterial genetic exchange, and sort of thereafter becomes this grand man of science. And he's the president of the Rockefeller University in the 1980s in New York City at the height of the AIDS epidemic. And he's concerned that, about coming place writ large, and he makes a statement to the, um, to the Pentagon that there's no reason to believe that AIDS is the last word in what nature has in store for us. And so he comes back and he convinces the Institute of Medicine to convene another important panel on emerging infections. And while most of that is concerned with viruses, Antibiotic resistance gets carried along for that as well. And I really see the early 1990s as another critical pivot point, pivot point in the history of antibiotic resistance. So after the, the publication of this uh, volume, we see sober technical assessments from the Office of Technology Assessment, from the CDC, from the American Society of Microbiology. We also start seeing this as an increasingly popular trope for the media, right? Notions of killer microbes and the antibiotics. You can really start seeing this in the early 1990s. And it would continue thereafter. Uh, we could have had another really important pivot point in 2001 when the WHO had its first global strategy for containment of antimicrobial resistance, but that was to be released literally on 9-11. So in some ways, uh, the momentum does kind of stabilize. It doesn't get to quite take off at that time. But I would argue that in the last few years, we've seen yet another um, inflection point. And perhaps in some ways, this is represented by, by Dame Sally Davis's 2013 document. And this has continued to this time so in this past year alone, I'm sorry, this is two years ago, this is the WHO's Global Action Plan, this is the White House's National Action Plan. In the past year alone, we see Jim O'Neill's report on antimicrobial resistance, looking at the combined public health and economic consequences of resistance. We actually had the UN high-level meeting on antimicrobial resistance in September, only the fourth time they had devoted a high-level meeting to a public health concern per se. In all these um, reports, we see a similar taxonomy of, of, of proposed measures to forestall this post antibiotic error. Part of these are simply improving the knowledge base of how much resistance is out there and how it actually correlates with antibiotic usage. We see efforts to reduce demand for drugs, whether through reducing the incidence of disease itself or um, through improving diagnostics and encouraging the rational prescribing of medications. The third one, however, is increasing the supply. And here I just want to step back for a second and point to a historical irony and the actual collision of these two reform efforts. All right, so Max Finland in the 1950s and 1960s and his colleagues said that, look, in the context of, of flooding of the market with antibiotic remedies, we need to make, make the FDA more stringent in its adjudication of drug efficacy. Right, so, and, and this not only applies with respect to antibiotics, but with respect to drugs more largely. 
in recent years out of concern about this post-antibiotic era and concerns about the withdrawal of, of industry from the marketplace, from, from the antibiotic marketplace, we've seen calls to um, make the FDA a bit less stringent with respect to how drugs get on the market. And this was just uh, voted into law and signed this week as part of the 21st Century Cures Act. The hope is that the act will allow new good drugs on the market, but the concern is, of course, that it can allow new bad drugs on the market. And we see this tension between these various dystopias of irrational medicines versus post-antibiotic era, and we'll see how this plays out. In all of this, there's an aspiration to irrational therapeutics. And I had started off with this original slide uh, from, from Selman Waxman, but I want to look at the middle for a second. Because this was the aspiration that others less toxic and more active will be found, costs will be reduced, side effects will be either eliminated or controlled, physicians will have well-crafted labs at their disposal to evaluate each antibiotic and determine at once which one's required for the treatment of specific disease. Self-medication will be reduced to a minimum. Government control of antibiotics will be tightened so as to render antibiotics safer, more useful, and less expensive. For decades, attention has focused on the, the combination of education and regulation necessary to achieve this, to have the right drug for the right patient and the right amount at the right time. But in recent years, the World Bank and others have begun to focus at the structural determinants of who gets sick in the first place, at the structures of care themselves, uh, for how we can actually forestall antibiotic resistance. We see these links to the structures of care delivery itself. My hope is that history can help us not only examine where we've been, perhaps frame and help influence where we're moving together as we continue to examine and perhaps influence this co-evolution of bugs, and drugs, patients, clinicians, reformers, industry, and governments alike. So thank you. All right, so now we're going to open it up to questions from the audience um, for the next 10 minutes or so, I guess. Hi, thanks so much for, uh, for a great talk. Um, I was wondering if there's any sense in terms of the relative contribution uh, in antibiotic resistance in terms of giving antibiotics to people to cure disease versus giving antibiotics to livestock. Um, I wonder if, if that's been uh, sorted out at all. Um, I guess Go for it. <laughs> not to my knowledge. Um, there seems to be good, there's, you know, there's absolutely strong evidence that human use spreads resistance, of course. But the evidence for livestock is there. It's not quite as strong. So if I had to guess, I would say human use probably is driving it a little more. But I think the solid evidence isn't there, to my knowledge. You hear a number of statements about the, the, the tonnage used in, in livestock industry is far greater than used in humans. How that correlates with actually which one is resist, res, responsible for resistant infections that we care about in humans, I think that's where the knowledge base is, is still to be determined. But I think one thing I want to just add to this about livestock use, you'll hear a lot of things about, we're not using any antibiotics that are clinically used. But there are many antibiotics that are very, very similar, you know, one atom off of ones that are clinically used that are being used in livestock. And resistance to those very often can cause resistance to ones that are clinically used. So it isn't simply enough to say, we're not using the clinically used antibiotics, but rather, you know, we're not using ones that give any kind of resist, that have any kind of cross resistance. Um. In your huge rectangular Petri dish, do you, or have you found mutations that haven't been found before such that you're finding out um, mutations before they become a problem? Um, we haven't looked that closely at the relation to clinically found mutations in the plate. I can say that we have found mutations that haven't been found in other directed evolution experiments with the same organism. Um, we think this is because of differences in the selective pressures, but hopefully something like this will be able to let us start looking at finding out what are resistance mutations for drugs even before they're ever used in the clinic. Hi, Mark Lipsitch from the School of Public Health. Um, 
a, a brief plug. There, uh, two years ago, a bunch of us wrote a paper that's in the journal Evolutionary Applications, which tries to review some of the evidence on the livestock versus humans issue, although it doesn't incorporate the recent data on MCR1 because it hadn't happened yet. Um, so, what's, so what's the answer? Since uh, <laughs> uh, I would agree with you that the evidence is much weaker on the role of livestock use in driving clinically significant human resistance, particularly uh, um, because human use is so much closer to the selective environment from, for transmission. Um, but, but it would also be very, very hard to find that evidence if it existed. And that's some of what we talk about in the paper. Um, my question uh, is about the notion of rational antibiotic use. Um, and I apologize because I came in a little bit late, but has there been a historical trend in what that means and what the components of that are? Yes, and it's, and it's a fascinating topic in its own right. So we first seen that term being thrown about in the early 1950s. Uh, Ernst Jowitz, who was the first person we're advocating the usage of antibiotics in combination, tries to define it sort of at a gross population level. You see in that 1969 paper where they literally try to define it as the right drug for the right bug at the right time. And there's, there's, a, there's a quote from the head of, 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 a, of a company at that time, in, I think 72, saying, you know, rational medicine is whatever you, the, those in power say it is. Right? So there's always been this tension over it. And we think of it on the one hand as sort of this, you know, in a very pragmatic sense of it's doing more good than harm. There are these, but it has, carries all these other senses of this is for public health benefit and it's not for either economic benefit or any other you know, personal benefit that is, it's always rational. If I'm going to try and make my patient happy and get through the, the clinic session or I'm trying to sell more of the drug, that's rational in a certain sense. Uh, so it does get defined in these very sort of combination of moral ways, pragmatic ways, and it, 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 the term itself is fascinating to trace, and you can trace it in government hearings over the 1970s and 1980s. We have a question here. Hi, I um, really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. I'm curious to know about, um, from the policy angle, this question of how profitable it is in today's era for companies to take um, therapies for antibiotic resistance to market, and um, how important of a role is that going to play, and who are we going to be looking to to come up with the new new antibiotics uh, today? So. Yeah, I'll start. I mean, it's... It's tough. I think this is one of the major things that's being discussed like at this UN meeting, at these high-level meetings, is how do, you, how do you encourage industries to develop a product where you're sort of explicitly telling them it's probably not going to last for that long, and while it does last, we'd like you to sell as little of it as possible. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I think you know, this, this economic question is one of the major factors and one of the major things we need to solve beyond the basic science if we're going to tackle this problem. And, and people like Kevin Uderson are proposing these models that decouple sales and profit from, from uh, so that decouples revenue from sales per se. So they propose these, whether grants or prizes based on value of the drug, that that's the rationale behind, behind those models. How do you incentivize industry and not promote overuse? Actually, I have two questions. <laughs> uh, so a uh, first one for Mike, Michael. Uh, so my question is uh, with regards to the notion of uh, substances, chemicals that target the resistance mechanism itself. You mentioned uh, quickly that there has been such compounds or examples of such. I was wondering if you could share with us one. Um, so this is a paper that the came out of the Kashoni lab that Laura Stone, who I showed a picture of, published, I think, two months ago where we looked for compounds that selectively, sort of selectively inhibited bacteria with the tetracycline efflux pump. Um, and we identified two compounds, beta thigiflycin and disulfram, um, which, can, which do appear to do this, at least in vitro. We haven't gone to anything more like animal models yet. The idea would be that you would use it in conjunction with a drug to prevent? Right, right. You use it either in conjunction with a drug or you know, one of the nice things about selecting against one of these mobile resistance elements is that if you select against it, you select against everything else on that element too. So you might be able to use it in a way, you know, if you have a resistance element that has both tet efflux and a beta-lactamase on it, 
you know, you get rid of the TED efflux, you also lose the beta lactamase, and now you could maybe use penicillin, for example. So. Um, one question for Scott, actually. Um, so um, being a clinician who practices, I've always been curious about why, you know, the duration of treatment is either seven days or 14 days. Is there a reason historically why that came along and whether that's being questioned at the moment? Yeah, it's, it's a good question because if you take out your Sanford guide and we look at those, those numbers, how many of those are based on real trials? I think the proportion is very small. I mean, it's been studied in certain things, like I think strep throat, had some, some data behind that, but many of these were based on a priori studies, and that's why, like since I was a med student, the treatment of UTIs went from however many days to seven days to three days. Th those are all being redefined, but, but I think historically, um, a lot of these were just chosen, and they seemed to work, and hadn't been challenged at that time. Yeah, I want to add, so when we wrote this review, I tried to find, you know, track down these recommendations through all the different references for make sure you take your whole dose of antibiotics. You know, it needs to be this long. And every single one that I tracked down actually went to Fleming's Nobel Prize speech <laughs> where he warned against it and stopped there. Um, I know there, has been, there have been a couple of studies recently looking at changing the duration because you know, by sort of, I mean, there's no reason intrinsically why bacteria should know what seven or 14 days is, <laughs> right? They, they don't have weeks. <laughs> um, and so you know, there are efforts to look at this and to, to try to not give as much antibiotics necessarily. Do my feelings that there was one study that came out where four or five years ago about eight versus 15 days. It's a European study. So they do eight and 15, not seven and 14, um, in, uh, in patients with uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia. And it proved that eight was non-inferior in most circumstances. But anyway, yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you both. Did, did it not work? Yeah. Um, so resistance didn't spread as because resistance didn't spread as fast as antimicin because it wasn't used as much. Um, now colistin is also used as a last line, and bank and colistin aren't used that much because they're injection only. They've got all sorts of uncomfortable side effects, and probably my guess is they just weren't used as much. And they were the ones that were left. I think neither, you'll see a lot of times in antibiotic resistance talks, the sort of plot of resistance and then drug discovery dropping also. It's a little disingenuous, because actually there's been a fair revival of it recently, and a couple other drugs have been discovered. So I think that's why neither of us put that plot up. Because that is part of my that is part of my proposal for my own lab. Okay. Um, I don't know. I certainly hope it does. Well, that was a really good question. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming. Hi. Hi. Really good. Thanks. I was just wondering. 
Um, did one 2D gradient once, okay. didn't work very well. As in, they didn't like, get resistant? Uh, no, as in, I glued the plastic together no. incorrectly. It warped because of the space heaters, the aggro cracked, and everything went crazy. Got it. Uh, yeah, you don't think to yourself, you know, I'm going to go get a PhD so that I can learn how to weld plastics together effectively. Yeah. But, like, 